All right. Thanks everyone for coming to the end of the second of end of the first month uh, wrap up call kind of thing where we will uh, analyze together with you you know what went well and what didn't go well for the first month of the ether program we have a tentative agenda with uh, just a simple four item agenda uh, to discuss in minute segment each we'll start with what went well we'll go to what could be improved We'll then we'll talk about the suggestions for the second month for the editor rewards, and then we should discuss the minimal required editor activity. And so to kick off, let's start what went well in the program. Has anyone any experience to share the things that they did that particularly worked out for them, or maybe you know, generally what did you enjoy doing most in the program, things of that nature? Well, oh, I am. Um, oh, sorry, you go ahead, Patrick. Thank you. Um, so, for what went well from my perspective, uh, we have like a couple of like people like generally passively watching research Hub for the past few months, like interested in potentially helping us out in different ways. And uh, a few contacted me and were like, whoa, you guys have like some solid traction going on. Like, there's like actually some pretty good activity and like good conversations happening. And even um, there's somebody on Twitter who uh, tweets at us almost every day now um, to fix issues because they're using Research Hub as their number one social media feed. So like, it's kind of cool because we're starting to see people who are actually like uh, very much appreciating the content that's being like shared on Research Hub and massively consuming it. So it, it seems like we're onto something to like hook, uh, you know, people who just want to learn more about science. So to me, it's very promising that like interested people are very excited about the past month. So that's, a, from my perspective, the number one thing that's going well. Nick, you were saying before? Thanks. Yeah, it's been, uh, I've had some some good kind of comment back and forth a couple of times with people, multiple replies. And it's been just been really neat to talk about, you know, it's a type of science that I'm passionate about and just corresponding with people, you know, they might have certain ideas and me being able to give some expertise I may have on it. So it's just been, it's been really great to communicate with people outside of, you know, my cohort in grad school. So I've been really enjoying it. Was it mostly the same people in different conversations or different every time? Oh, uh, different every time, actually. Oh, nice. Um, I, I, I can chip in. Um, not so much is happening in, 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 in the business hub. And I'm actually a little bit surprised because there are a lot of people doing research on, on business. And I tried to recruit some of my colleagues at work. And I, I started explaining to them how this works and, and stuff. And I realized that um, they had difficulties, of course, like that the nature of crypto was a little bit vague for them. But on the other hand, they didn't really understand why they should do this thing. And I was trying to make the case that, hey, look, we're, we're just struggling with publishing and there are all these different problems and it makes sense to just start from, from somewhere. And that's when I came up with this idea that maybe we need to have sort of, I know we have this notebook and then there are some kind of um, sound bites that we could, we could use to communicate in, in, I don't know, to send emails or in, in conversation with people, but like a better way of, uh, kind of onboarding people, like just really taking their hands and then moving them through the website and really showing them once how it's done. If there would be, I, I, I didn't actually look for it, but if there is any video tutorial for, for such a thing, that would be very, very helpful to say like, okay, this is two minutes, a, a two minute video, just go through it and then you're going to grasp it. And it's really simple. And then you know, like I uploaded a couple of papers from 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 uh, some colleagues, and I told them that oh, you can go and claim uh, your your tokens. Like, and what am I gonna do with it? So th these kind of to really make these things uh, clear to flesh out the, the possibilities that they can get out of um, out of interacting with the system, I think is going to be very useful. Yeah, and uh, we are definitely working on something like that. Uh, Ricardo here might be more knowledgeable. We have 
Wafa and Scott are working on kind of like the document that you might share with other people to onboard them kind of like a little more systematic, automatic way. And I think we do have plans for um, getting people to record a kind of like a manual video, an introduction video on the topic so that you can send it to others and they can watch it. But I don't want to take too much time. We have a few more hands here. The first one was uh, Giria or Girija, sorry. I unmute myself. So hi, everyone. This is the first time I'm joining this call. Good to see you all. Um, I actually need the hub set up, Patrick. Remember we had discussed? Yes, definitely. I, sort I can of say arts and help. Uh, what? Uh, I'll set your hub up after this call. Sorry, there's been um, okay. lots, of, lots of files to put out. So uh, Yeah, so I... Yeah, that's fine. I just feel kind of guilty accepting anything for this month because I actually don't have the hub set up. So, um, yeah, as soon as you can let me know, that'd be great. And the other thing I would say is like with the RSC, it might help to actually define a value for that token. I think otherwise, if you don't have like a monetary value associated with it, that I, I feel like that people would understand that. Are you able to sort of share that? So I think there sure. actually is a monetary value. Um, it's just oh, yeah. not um, viewable on like the research hub, like website itself. And I don't know, maybe that might be a, a good thing to include maybe in like a corner somewhere, maybe like the running price of research coins. So, you know, like, um, did yeah. someone give me four cents or did someone give me $4, you know? And that would be really great. Like what is the um, monetary value right now? I don't know personally. It's about uh, three cents right now per three research. cents. See, like that's that's useful to know. I think it really helps set context. So, thank you. To, to, to chime in here, there, there's a point in the future where we'll be able to like display the USD value of research coin on Research Hub. We think that's going to be a big unlock just to make it more obvious to people what why they'd want to earn research coin. But um, I think we have to wait uh, a little bit longer to get more coins out there just to help uh, stay safe from a legal perspective. Like we want, we want people initially earning it because of its utility, which is uh, to participate in the governance of Research Hub and to use it on the platform. And so we want to we focus on that utility initially and the financial value can uh, come later once uh, we're in a safer position legally. All right, Ricardo, you had a hand? Thanks. You're on mute. Um, so just basically for like what Yashar was saying uh, about like the suggestion, I'm actually really happy that you brought We have like now uh, basically we're starting. Ricardo, there is something with your connection. Okay, can you hear me now? Better? Okay, okay, yeah, sorry yes. about that. Um, so basically, just wanted to say that we're uh, making progress on the video, like we're getting in contact with uh, somebody that can make an animation to basically just explain what RSCs are, how the DAO functions and so on. So yeah, I was just happy that you brought that up because actually that's what we are working on currently. So if that in your you know, vision kind of like helps to get, un, you know, research out better understood. That's basically where we're going. So yeah, pretty happy about that. Also for the token claiming that will come after, you know, you get a video and then you can say, go claim your paper. Cause you know, you get now a sense of like what the research coins are uh, used for. Right. I just wanted to add to that today. I also wrote on, on the, the, the report bog channel this is not necessarily a bot but like kind of uh, if you claim with your institutional email address and what happens when if if your login address is not the same which is often the case because you have to you, we use a google login right um so like is, is it going to be done manually and, and i think you probably don't want to do it manually so i, I don't know what the process is going to look like 
That's a great suggestion. Um, our author claiming is very much a V1. So we asked for institutional emails to help prevent like spammers essentially from trying to claim people's profiles. Um, but you're right. There's lots of academics who use like, different emails for various things. So uh, like a V2 will be able to incorporate uh, lots of different email addresses. I think even now you can use a Gmail. It just asks for institutional, but we need to make that more clear. So that's a great point. Or just have like another section where you could also enter your the, the kind of your login email address. So yeah, that, that could be matched automatically, I suppose. Uh, so before we move on to other topics, are there any any uh, things that well went well kind of experiences to share more uh, besides uh, besides the you know interesting conversations unfolding and what Patrick uh, uh, mentioned that we get traction from users who are not actively posting or enjoy the content? Yeah, I, I had an experience actually. So. Um... So I, uh, my girlfriend is also in science. She's uh, works in a neuroscience lab, and I've been kind of like talking to her about Research Hub for the last month now. And you know, as a nat as a scientist, naturally, you know, people generally are skeptics, right? And so there was a lot of things that were brought up that were like, oh, well, I don't know how this would work because you know this could get gamed here or you know things of that nature. And then actually, like, got her to get on the website and she started dabbling with the website and typed in some key buzzwords for her research and found a paper that was super relevant and she started getting excited and 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 that uh, is going to be uh, presenting that paper at her journal club this week actually so it was really just nice to see kind of the perspective of someone that may have been a little bit apprehensive to like be involved with it and then just actually getting integrated with the product itself and using it and seeing it used for its utility that it was intended to be used for was really, really nice to see. Um, so I think getting people to like actually uh, engage with the website itself, I think will will make a lot of believers. That's interesting. That, that kind of implies that there is a barrier at, at the entry level, right, in which people might be skeptical and such. But then if they start using it, they, um, you know, their skepticism is reduced and they enjoy using websites. Yeah, definitely. I think like the familiarity, I think tr like what keeps getting brought up uh, every time I've mentioned this to anybody is like, well, the big journals, you know, we trust them. Like we trust that nature and science are going to have quality, you know, people looking over and quality work that's going to be published into those journals. So that's kind of the big I think point of like contention that people have generally is like, oh, who are these, you know, these are just random people that are, you know, commenting and interacting and things like that. Yes, this is a great point. If you look at like the adoption curves of preprint servers, uh, places like BioArchive, MedArchive, Archive, the first couple of years, they, they barely have any traction. And I think people show up the first time, they're like, oh, what's going on here? Like, I don't fully understand. They see it again in six months, and they become like kind of familiar. And then the third time, they're like, "Oh, like this is cool. Like I might submit a preprint here." And, and over time, um, like people start to trust what's happening and then begin to use it. So, like if you look at like just BioArchive versus like any other like content type of website, it's the same growth curve, but it's just stretched out because scientists, you know, they're they are pretty skeptical by nature, and um, I think like they value their information. They don't want to like take unnecessary risks. So this is, I think, a, a common theme that we're going to experience. And like making an effort to, um, I guess, be trustworthy is probably worth being conscious about in order to like help to accelerate this kind of like um, skepticism or lack of skepticism. Do you think there are any ways that we can expedite this or convey this in an active manner or is, is it just more a case of being around for for a while and you know having a reputation of not messing up too much yeah so from my perspective i think word of mouth is the best way to go and so like if our editors have good experiences you know i think like inherently they're more likely to talk to their friends you know about research hub 
And if they relay like, positive emotions, uh, more trust, you know, will happen. If they relay negative emotions, you know, less trust will happen. So I, I think it's one of those things where if we just keep working hard and doing our best and like taking in feedback and trying to make the best product we can, over time, like things will build up and growth will accelerate. Yashar, you had a hand. I just wanted to say, like, I, I totally agree with you that that the, there is a kind of a trajectory and there are phases to to this thing happening. But also, there are things that we could, uh, I think, you could do in in terms of implementing new features, such as, for instance, if you could have this um, collaborative notebook feature that I, instead of going to Google Docs. I can bring people that I'm working with on a paper into Research Hub and then do that that work there. And I think kind of kind of bring in the, the 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 other people and making them familiar with the system through using that as a tool. And then uh, I think afterwards, uh, this trust that you just mentioned, I think, is going to increase and uh, the skepticism is going to sink to some extent. So I think these value added features, um, which, which are not necessarily exactly what Research Hub does, but allows kind of, you know, like demolishes in a way the, the entry barriers to some extent would be very relevant in my opinion. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, just in general, the value prop of a preprint server that rewards users with tokens is a lot more familiar than like a, a Reddit forum where people can earn tokens for discussing papers. It's a lot more in like a standard academic workflow. So I couldn't agree more. And actually our ELN is on our staging website now. We're doing QA and should push it to production either later tonight or tomorrow morning. So, so that should be just around the corner when people will be able to publish uh, to research up directly. Right. Uh, so we have already kind of transitioned into the next discussion topic, but uh, how about we do a formal transition into discussing things that could be improved? And we're already talking about it, but what would you like to see changed perhaps in the editor program or in Research Hub um, more generally that you think would improve the quality of your experience as editor and perhaps the quality of experience of you know, your subscribers in your hubs? So just a little bit of context here before we jump into feedback is the best thing that can possibly happen within an organization. So like the more critical, the better, like no feelings will be hurt. Like if, if you guys have had any, like even slightly negative experiences, it's better to, to talk about them. So that way we can address them. Um, but yeah, so in general, like, like don't worry about like offending anybody, like open and honest feedback is the way to go when it comes to like young organizations growing. So as I as I was bringing up uh, in a couple uh, call we had, uh, do you think like this the right place to talk about a potential like restructuring of like the help? Like you think that this is actually like a question for you all. Do you think like the structure of like how the hubs are structured within the within research hub is like um, uh, appropriate? Like would you want to see like disciplines organized in different ways? Have you ever uh, took a look at a, like a, other hubs like how they organize outside of your your hub. This is just a question that I have in terms of like onboarding people. Like if uh, somebody, someone new comes into the platform and want to like search for hubs, do you think like they're well organized? Because we were actually thinking about a potential, uh, you know, in the future, maybe uh, kind of like restructuring, not like really changing the hub itself, but like kind of putting into a different like uh, sub disciplines and research fields and so on. So I just wanted to have like your feedback on how do you think it is organized at the moment and if you feel anything. Uh, you know, could be made better. I think, uh, Ricardo, I, I think like it's probably contingent on like certain hubs. So like, for example, like I'm in the, the editor of the neuroscience hub and I think neuroscience gets like quite, quite a bit of activity. And I think, I think people who go there know exactly what to see and what they're getting into. Um, but that being said, maybe there's some other hubs that might actually 
be more suitable as a sub hub in something else or more suitable like integrated like together with something else um and so in my case i i think it it's okay the way the structure is but i could see it being um kind of adjusted for some other maybe smaller hubs or more interdisciplinary hubs okay thanks thanks jeffrey It's kind of like an interesting balance that we need to strike where um, when there's activity in hubs, it's the best in order to like be a welcoming place for like passive consumers who just happen to stumble upon research hub. But at the same time, uh, I'd say like half the editors during the interviews requested like hubs very specific to their fields of study. Um, just because like if you're um, like a example i guess is like a psychiatrist if i'm interested in psychiatry papers and i go to the medicine hub only a couple are going to be really like specific to me and my colleagues and so there's there's like an interesting question of do we want to like zoom in resolution so that way individual scientists will have like value to share with their colleagues which in theory would make referrals easier if you're like sharing like with the people in your lab or do we want to optimize for like the passive consumer who stumbles across Research Hub and comes to a hub where there are already like three or four editors rather than one spread in like three or four separate hubs? Um, so yeah, don't totally know the answer here, but I think like a good solution could be a DAO vote where we have like a, a couple of like predetermined like taxonomies of scientific fields and we have everybody um, put their research coin to use by like voting on which structure uh, we want. There's other things we could do too, where like maybe um, we, we have like a cost to open up a hub. So the, the structure is already there, but if an editor wants to like have a sub hub, um, they can stake tokens to essentially start it and become like the founding editor. Um, there, there are cool tokenomic mechanisms we can do to like make sure that the founding editor is dedicated to the program and like wants to maintain something for extended period of time. But um, yeah, I agree. I think this is, I think the structure of the hub now is not in its final state and it would be good to do a DAO vote in order to get everybody on the same page about like exactly what taxonomy we want for the scientific fields. Yeah, I totally you agree. And actually, yeah, sorry, go on. Go ahead, Ricardo. Yeah, so uh, as you said, I just wanted to uh, basically uh, even like make more positive like the uh, let's say the outlook that the hub can have like for example it's not good if like somebody you know jumps into a hub looking for something specific and finds a hub that it maybe is not like it's not curated there's no papers but hub is still there so have like something like a hiding hide fa function that basically if the hub is not populated there's no activity there's no uh I don't want to say like there's no reason for it to be there but like we just want to have like show the best picture that we have and then if you know somebody is looking for a specific hub or want to uh, put content into a specific hub can maybe request it at a later time because i have the 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 hubs in front of me and there's many that are like not curated so that can happen if somebody you know jumps on the platform and see it so yeah it could be a balance in between the two do we have any data on how users even interact with the hub structure? Because, you know, obviously it's taxonomy and the, uh, the thoughtfulness of the distinction between the hubs is very important for the editors, but are the users knowledgeable enough to appreciate it? Or do they kind of log in, subscribe to 10 familiar words and then just log in to the home page after that, never to revisit or even be aware of how many editors are there on the hub they subscribe to. We should be able to see that with hotspot, I think, like by the clicks, like looking if people actually go into the hubs and sub hubs and like check different hubs. Yeah, we, we can do a hot jar viewing if you guys want to, just to like see everybody who lands on the hubs page. I, I know in Google Analytics, I think our hubs page is like within the top five pages clicked. So I think it is like a fairly popular uh, page that people go to in order to orient themselves when they get to Research Hub. But yeah, we, we could do a call um, to understand it better if you all wanted to. Yeah, also something related to the, um, to the hubs, like at least like the numbers that you that you see like in the hubs there's a lot of hubs that show having a lot of papers but actually they've not like have like few do you know why is that happening uh 
it's like a bug or like a specific feature? Uh... I'll, I'll look into it. We were automatically pulling papers for a while into a bunch of different hubs and we stopped doing that just to allow for like kind of more manual curation. Um, so this could be like an artifact of previous papers that were in hubs. But um, yeah, thanks for mentioning it. I'll write it down and like talk to our developers and kind of figure out an answer to that. All right. Any other ideas on things that can be improved? I had I had one idea um, just to throw out there. So let's say if you're in the biochemistry hub, right, and then you want to go to the biology hub. There's, there are papers that would be probably tagged in both, or a lot of times you'll have hubs that are closely related, but I'm just thinking from a user standpoint to go from one of those to the other, although they are very similar in discipline, it would be the same as if I was going from that to an architecture hub or something. So maybe if there was some sort of, if you're in a hub and then there's some sort of stat of, oh, this is cross tagged with posts from this other hub too and then that could because i feel like for me when i clicked join hubs i kind of stayed in that lane um and that might help kind of incentivize people moving between hubs more freely versus going back to the the full appendix like taking zooming all the way out and in um and then you could that may help with some of the structuring um too versus you know trying to figure out where something fits if you could freely move between them just to clarify, do you, do you think we would benefit from kind of like a suggestion mechanism if you are browsing one hub frequently, then the, there is a pop-up, hey, maybe consider checking out this hub as well. A lot of the papers you've been reading are tagged in that ha hub also. Yeah, yeah, something, something like that. Because a lot of times the papers I like to read are in multiple hubs, but I have to find them by going to that hub and then seeing it. So some way to kind of ease that movement between might keep people more engaged overall versus just in, I like this discipline and not knowing about collaborative efforts in between that and others. It's just a thought though. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thought. Um, I think our navigation between hubs is not ideal at the moment. Again, it's a very much a V1. Um, so we do have nested hubs kind of like on our uh, engineering radar. So what we'll do is once we're maybe like a month out from approaching it, we'll post it in our GitHub and like kind of solicit feedback from everybody so we can like put together like the exact like product specifications that we need to build. Um, so when that happens, I'll, I'll ping the community channel and try and get everybody to hop into the forum on GitHub in order to share their thoughts on like what's the best way to reorganize like relationships between hubs, and we'll be able to kind of like build out based on everybody's feedback. Sounds great. All right, so it's time to move on to the next topic, and that one. This one, Patrick will do a little bit of an introduction about the suggestions for the next version of the editor rewards. Yes, during during like the like initial uh, editor interviews, um, we kept the uh, like basically roles and responsibilities very loose. Where the idea is, hey, we want to get people in, we want to get feedback, we want to basically let editors control. Um, how we track their activity and how they're like rewarded for participating within the program. So um, after the first month, I'm actually like pretty excited. I know everybody on our team is pretty excited about the activity. Um, there's been a lot of good papers, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning. But one thing um, that we've noticed is within the metrics, our weekly active contributors have pretty much gone up one to one with editors. So um, in theory, like we have a lot more content and a lot more passive consumers who are enjoying what's being posted, but our North Star metric is weekly active contributors. And ideally we'd like to have editors um, like help to basically like refer more people into their hubs to have more robust discussions. So what we'd like to do is add like either bonus RSC for some kind of like, uh, like referral activity or like change the incentive structure. Um, we haven't really thought about exactly what we want to do, but I want to take the next 15 minutes to talk about ways that we could potentially reward people for helping to increase the weekly active contributors in their hubs. We have just like a process of how this will work. 
We'll, we'll collect feedback here now. Um, we have like a, a DAO operations call later tonight where um, there are more DAO members uh, who essentially will like come together and figure out the V2 rewards we want to go with for the month of February. And then um, we'll host the DAO vote to approve like the, the V2 of the editor rewards. So I guess, does anybody have any thoughts kind of like how um, we could improve the reward structure for February in order to try and like increase weekly active contributors and help. I have this a quick a question just sure. to begin. Uh, so do you think that possibly if we try to recruit people in a kind of like a mono manual fashion, would we end up in the same situation as right now? So the amount of manual introduced users will match one to one the amount of uh, active contributors. Yeah. So I, I think it's hard to know, um, kind of, this is, this is like a one month experiment is the way we're thinking of it. Like after maybe like three or four months of the editor program um we like basically want to collect a bunch of data in order to have like a more stable reward structure that we'd be able to scale up over time so the idea here is to try something sort of new and then compare it to the first month see what worked what didn't work in month three we'll probably try something entirely new again and then compare it to the first two months see what worked what didn't work and by like month four or five we hope to have like some data on like a good recipe on like what we should do in order to scale up the program long term and bring in a bunch of new editors so what about something um so i'm adapting this from just like just kind of common referral systems for like for example there's a wallet that i use if i refer somebody to use that wallet um any swaps that they do in that wallet i would get some small percentage of it like for the existence of the person who I referred to keeps doing their swap. So maybe something like that, where there's a referral links. And if I send a referral link over to friend number one and they become a weekly active contributor and they keep earning research coin because they keep making great comments and great publications, then for the entirety of that, I will be earning some tiny percentage of research coin along the way. And that incentivizes me to really recruit people who I believe are going to be very active because if I recruit a bunch of people who won't be active, I get no reward out of it. Yeah, I like it. That's a great suggestion. Um, we plan on uh, basically making the referral system more robust over the next week. So that's a, it's a great suggestion. I think we could definitely go with that. Hey, y'all. It's Scott. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So my general thought is something more of like, uh, I don't want to say anything goes reward system, but imagine there's a number of coins or dollars, however you want to do it, that are available. And, you know, there's some kind of competitive aspect to it that's free because like for instance, in criminology, we're intentionally trying to avoid the too much of the like targeted, hey, you, hey, you, hey, you, because we don't think that's going to be sustainable. So as much as we could get a quick jump from it and it would work, it wouldn't work the next month. Um, and that's like just us in our network, like not necessarily true for you. So the general point is if we could try to figure out a way that, you know, is more rewarding of the North Star than doing the North Star a certain way. Mm, that makes sense. Um, I guess like one thought that we had had is like um, hosting events around your hub. So either having like a, a paper of the month where there's kind of like something pinned to the top and like there's sort of an effort put in to have a like discussion um, around this specific paper. And then maybe like that paper is shared to like uh, Reddit, um, Twitter, you know, other like social media places where um, there might be people who want to engage in it or like hosting MAs and events, like you could say like, hey, there's like a added bonus for anybody who hosts an AMA and gets the author to respond to questions on a paper in their hub. Um, we could pretty much do anything. So curious if anybody has like a uh, sort of like community building type of ideas. Okay. 
is okay i have a question related to somewhat related to that and the community building is like how do you get out the message that there's an event worth going to and so like one of my questions is what are people's thoughts on creating social media accounts or otherwise um creating you know those kinds of not feelers but those objects or whatever we want to call them out in the world that are the the bridge between twitter and research hub or facebook and research hub and so on and so on um you know because that kind of i feel like is the ultimately it's going to have to happen and it will happen naturally um so i was just also curious about maybe like you know incentivizing setting up essential things like that and also i think essential in the sense of like this is a DAO, and a DAO is supposed to do things on its own and you know that that kind of you know stuff where it gets beyond our personal networks and people can come to us yeah so i i think a great open source feature would be like a, a bot you can turn on that like automatically will uh, tweet like the uh, most discussed paper in your hub or something every week. Um, just like from my own anecdotal experience, we did a bunch of like uh, AMAs at the very beginning of Research Hub. If you look on our YouTube page, they're like some of the first videos. And so, for example, we did an AMA with a biohacker talking about mini circles, which is like a vector for gene therapy. And so, um, like, I, I would share it on like Reddit biohacking, Reddit everything science. There are a bunch of biohacking Facebook groups. So I just go in there and like post the event and say, hey, anybody wants to come can come. Um, and we get like 20 or 30 people who would show up just because it's like interesting content to them. So I think there are some pretty like lightweight ways to like post uh, events on various social media channels that takes like like an hour to do um, and can be fairly effective when it comes to like targeting people who might be interested in that kind of like community building event. Nick, you were next in line. <clears throat> I just wanted to voice uh, some support for the idea of a paper of the month because I think that would kind of help galvanize people to see what the strength of Research Hub is. Because I think the community aspect and getting to talk with other people is really the best part of it. And having just a spotlight where it sort of inflates that and shows people how great that could be. I think that would be terrific in, in driving traffic. Because sometimes when you see, you know, a hub where there's there's interesting papers, but there's no comments, it's a little bit intimidating to break into that space. So kind of getting people to get pushed into it that way getting kind of swept up in i think would be would be a very a good way to drive traffic that's a great idea uh we will have to think through maybe how do we select this paper of the month but i think we can just do it in test mode and you know don't think about it too much and whatever the one of the editor proposes we can you know quickly gauge people's opinions on that paper in the editor channel and if it if it works maybe we can think of maybe putting some sort of banner on research hub that this is the paper of, of the month and then we will just think through what what kind of activities can we do in the comment section to this paper let's say all right olga you had a hand yeah, so uh, in terms of getting a message out there, I was thinking about like just general, you know, uh, PR things, like maybe try and reach out to like productivity influencers. There are several people who are like doing productivity kind of things about grad school on YouTube, for example. Uh, there are people who are doing this in text format. Uh, we can try to make uh, useful plugins for Zotero and Research Rabbit, which for sure can bring people because people are people like you know attach things to each other. So I'm wondering if we can also do these things. And Patrick, you mentioned that people have reached out and they essentially use Research Hub as a feed of sorts, right? So maybe we could capitalize on that even more. Yeah, totally. Um, I think there is a, a future state once we're starting to see the organic growth where we do some advertising. And like, I think that is a pretty good value prop of, hey, here's a custom curated feed of like different scientific fields that you're interested in. Um, 
when it comes to social media influencers, I know Wafa has done some work like helping to identify people that we could work with in order to help get the messaging out. Um, in general, we think we're a little bit early for like um, spending dollars on marketing. But one thing we could do is uh, help to recruit these types of like influencers as editors where they're actually like curating their own hub and maybe sharing it with their following. So that's definitely a, a possibility. But yeah, totally. Once we start to see the organic growth, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to spend some marketing dollars in order to get more eyes within Research Hub. Yeah, I'm also wondering if like people will be willing to do this just for fun because there are not a lot of academic tools out there just in general. I, I think ideally we want to get to the point where it is fun, where people are having fun and they're feeling like, yay, this is enjoyable type feeling. And once we have that, I think we'll have product market fit and it'll make sense to really scale up kind of the outreach. All right. Ikire, you heard the comment? Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, one of the reasons I uh, joined Research Hub and I, you know, I wanted to be editor was to demystify and explain concepts in simple terms, right? So I, I get this all the time, you know, the, our papers are too jargony, too abstruse, how can you explain it? And I've tried to do that with a few of my papers with tweak threads, sort of explaining the main concepts. And I, um, you know, I'm happy to do that with my hub as well. What I struggle with is, you know, there isn't much I can tag right now. So I can only tag like Research Hub or Patrick, I can like tag you, but that's it. I wonder if there's like additional tags um, we could use that you've identified would be sort of impactful that would connect to a bigger community. So are you thinking like ha hashtags that we could try? Yeah, hashtags, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's a great point. Um, we can ask Wafa to maybe put together a list of like uh, the ones that make the most sense to share on Twitter, and we can post that in the community channel um, to, just to have like some go-to ones so people don't have to think about it too hard. I think on um, on the Twitter side of things, there's uh, something called lists on Twitter, um, and so say you have multiple interests, um, you can generate like lists that um, maybe your interests are in, I don't know, NBA and your interests are in uh, science. And so you can have your science list, you can have your NBA list. If maybe if we like help curate like, like a list of like different kind of the term DSI keeps coming up. Um, maybe if we can create a list of like DSI, including like people like Patrick, like Research Hub, um, certain things. And then outside of that, maybe some other like companies that might be doing something adjacent to what we're doing and then we can um, make that list public so um, other people instead of just being like oh i need to go and pinpoint all these specific people to follow they just follow the list and they get exposure to research hub through following this kind of broad decentralized science list Yeah, I like it. I almost think we should do like a, uh, a Twitter workshop or something at some point this month where we just like anybody who wants to be active on social media, we can like, like just manually go over the exact strategies to use in an hour call or something like that. All right, Yashar. I just wanted to build on what Olga mentioned about tapping into these productivity people and so i mean I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with these um obsidian and rome research and um and mems and all these different um personal knowledge management platforms or, or or products and if that could be something for instance they would come to research hub and they could you know take a sound bite highlight something and then import into their library and I think creating just like a simple plugin could bring some of these people, if they see that they can connect their kind of working on this compounding 
ideas that is just like the cornerstone of this personal knowledge management guys i think that that could also could bring a lot of people and a lot of um yeah a lot, a lot of traffic and also they they are the ones that have a lot of like many audience um kind of from from different fields and they would really kind of market research hub to to their to their followers i think yeah so do you think is, is it generally a hard thing to to create a plugin so to synchronize with some external like bibliographical uh, software for example zotero do you know how an engineering team would be up for that or it shouldn't be too hard. I, I think it would probably take like two weeks or something like that. Um, so we'd have to dedicate a sprint to it. Um, and, and in general, we think there are kind of other features that might be more impactful in the short term, kind of like working on the ELN, and making that, uh, you know, very robust. But yeah, I, it's, it's definitely possible. And um, we plan to kind of create some open source bounties. So we could just have like the, the specs out there for anybody who actually wanted to build it. And um, I actually love recruiting. I could do a little bit of work when it comes to like trying to recruit some open source developers to come in. They would be excited about building that kind of like plugin. I, I think it's definitely doable if we put together some specs. All right, great. Uh, all right, so we have our last topic uh, of the of the day to talk about the minimum required activity for the next month for the editor program. Right now we. I believe we have the agreement that it's one paper and one comment a week, and preferably one paper and two comments, maybe one comment that highlights the paper you have shared and one comment that maybe perhaps connects you with some other users on the platform. But curious to hear what do you think would be the, let's say if you set the lowest bar, where should it be moving forward? And so just a little bit of context here, um, in, in theory, we think like from Research Hub Inc. side that the uh, editor rewards right now are like fairly significant. And we actually have like a, a bunch of people who want to be editors, but we can't really expand the program anymore just due to like budgetary constraints essentially until like the token, you know, is a little bit more out there and uh, liquid. Um, but so in theory, like, um, we, we want to think of the editors as almost like a, a sports team where like um, people kind of need to like hold each other accountable in order to have the best performance possible. So like if you look at the leaderboard, there's kind of wide ranges of um, like contributions so far. And so like I, I've spoken with some editors who are like, uh, you know, trying very hard and they sort of feel frustrated that some people are earning the same rewards for not doing very much. So um, from my perspective, I think that setting a culture of excellence is pretty important, knowing like at the same time that this is a, like a part-time responsibility. And so people can't put their like full attention into it. So like uh, people who have like tried pretty hard over the last month, I'm curious like what kind of like how you feel if you see people earning uh, the same amount of coins for not as much effort and then like what, what what do you expect you know of like the minimum editor in order to like keep pace with your efforts jeff i know and jeff and i talked about this yesterday jeff do you mind providing like a little bit of context here too uh, sorry, my computer died and I completely missed. I just joined back in like 10 seconds ago. Oh, yeah. No we're, we're just talking about like the minimum uh, contributions for the editor program, where in theory, like we want to set like a, a floor of activity um, in order to make sure that everybody's like people who are trying hard to make sure that their like efforts are respected. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, um, I think this is kind of important because we are getting like a pretty broad range of um, like user or editor activity. Um, and it's, you know, one thing, I guess, you know, even, even like the, the stats, you can say, you know, someone has 30 comments, but if their comment is uh, cool, sounds good, nice paper, 
like it's not a very meaningful input and i think it's in my opinion it's like very important to like if yeah uh, you know we are pro or if research hub is providing value via um research coin it's important that an equivalent amount of value be provided back from the editors um so i think like some kind of like baseline um kind of editor parameters like x amount of papers uploaded plus x amount of like meaningful comments made um you know or like x amount of you know contributors that have been added to your pub you know these things like we should probably talk about so that way you know we attribute better value to people who are bringing value to the platform and then less value to people who are bringing less value to the platform Uh, Nick, you were first. Uh, I, I completely agree about having some minimum threshold. Um, I also want to add in, I, I don't know how exactly this would be done, but maybe there should be some maintenance of a comment to paper ratio because it's far easier to post a paper on Research Hub than it is to make a comment. Um, and that's in addition to it being easier, it kind of makes it look like there's less activity by diluting out those which have comments. So they're just, just some sort of way of, of making sure that we're, you know, showcasing the discussion feature of Research Hub instead of making it more of a repository of papers, um, I think would be good. I agree. I have the same mindset. I, I, I do know that some people view, not view, but value the functionality of repository above the discussion, but I personally think that, yeah, if, if, if we, that's why I was a little bit against the automatic upload of papers, because it just creates a bunch of papers with no comment. And it, I think it creates a, an, uh, an unappealing visibility or unappealing impression that it, it's a barren website. Nobody's using it because everything is, you know, empty, no comment section. All right, Scott. Uh, so I think this is a really interesting one because it also ties back to metrics and, um, you know, being rewarded based on merit. And so my first thought is like kind of to Anton where we agree to disagree on this. I think discussions and comments right now take a lot of time away from otherwise possibly increasing active contributors, because I think the quickest way to really grow active contributors is to just focus on papers and getting them voted on. So that's fine. It'd be awesome if there was a way to actually, I don't think we should stifle trying different ways, but just being maybe not so centered on quantitative metrics, like how many paper uploads and how many comments, um, but more like, what are the people up to? Like what we've been doing in the criminology hub is not going to be captured by the metrics with the exception of uploading papers. But even that, like, you know, I could go into this, but we're trying to upload, we're trying to make it where there's like five new papers a day that are open access. So everyone can read them that just got published in a peer review stuff. And we keep having to change and expand how we do that. Cause what we find out is our current like sample, if you will, of top journals isn't enough so we need to increase it and we're changing things and that's just to say you know be mindful that people can be doing a lot while at the same time not doing these other things and you know everyone trying to go the same direction but just with different methods okay so how would we capture this so essentially that would create a situation where we basically say, hey, we don't have any good ways of gauge who is doing what, right? So that, that would defeat the purpose of this particular effort to try to quantify and set the baseline. I don't agree with that. And I should be clear, I don't mean, we should definitely quantify things. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's great, that's useful. Um, just being cognizant of there's many different things you could quantify and that, you know, if, if so, for example, if you're asking, how could we do this? We could do things like asking them to make a weekly report of what have they been up to? Um, just to, you know, again, like part of what I'd like to see more of 
is more exchange among editors saying, here's what we're trying. And like, it's working or not. And here's how it's gone. It doesn't have to be, you know, an essay, but a paragraph to say, kind of outline, for instance, the things we've been doing. We put those in Slack. I would love to see what other people are doing. Um, and you could quantify that as a one or a zero. Um, I did somewhat misspeak originally in that I should say, I would really like to see um, an emphasis on how many active contributors did we attract to our hub um, to see how are we doing, right? Like that's hard for me. Can I figure that out right now for the criminology hub? I don't know. Um, so maybe just going more to like right now, I guess what you could say is we're measuring things that aren't actually our North Star. So if I write three comments a week and upload three papers a week, it's still one active contributor. So right. Have, um, in, mm -hmm. in the editor leaderboard right now, um, we have like a weekly active contributor uh, growth or decline, like kind of per editor. Um, so like we could, in theory, like set like a barrier of like, like you need to grow your hub by 5% you know, or, or else, um, like have to reapply as an editor. Um, I, I don't love that one. I think it's, it's a little bit better to do it based on content contributions, but I do think we need some kind of like minimum metrics that are, um, objective and not subjective in order to make sure that, um, you know, everybody's held to a minimum standard and the people who are clearly like spending a lot of time, um, feel like their efforts are being respected. We also have like one minute left. I think this is a very important topic, so I'm happy to stick around as long as you all want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Ricardo, you had a hand. Yeah, just wanted to say that this is definitely like a complicated topic. Like I second what uh, Scott said, but also what you guys said. Uh, I think it should be a mix of like everything. Like there should be a base reward for content. Okay, so you should post this this and this then there should be another kind of like incremental reward based on the growth of the hub because this is also not like completely a fault of the editor itself it depends on the topic it is on how many people join and we can have control on everything unfortunately so getting fully judged on how much your hub grows is kind of also like complicated to actually evaluate another thing is and i fully second what like scott said on this one uh you can, I think, kind of like objectively evaluate like how people uh, like contribute to this. Like I, I, there's people that I see every time, you know, there's like, that I have discussion with, like you kind of see where the active part of the community is. If there, if, 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 even if there's like 90 editors, like there's like a subset of like people that I see every time. And like, I can, I could quantify that. So I think there's a component that is like less objective but could still be taken into account, like, let's say, contribution to, to growth, to, like, uh, engagement in the community, because after all, like, we're a community. And if you're not, like, being part of the community by, you know, exchanging messages or, like, kind of confronting other people, uh, you're doing half of your job, I would say. So this combination, I guess this would uh, address the problem that Patrick initially posed, right, that people uh, are a little upset about the discrepancy, right, between their amount of contribution and the same reward as, you know, people who contribute way less. So I guess maybe the, we could split the reward into parts. And so, for example, uh, just, just theorizing here. So what if the base reward would be 2K, right, and then based on the some sort of metric you could go to either 3k or perhaps even four if you know some users somehow achieved crazy growth something like that perhaps would satisfy both kind yeah. of editors yeah there could be a component of growth for example because that's important like group of your hub could be a component and another one is like community engagement could be another like kind of component and we could find way to measure we can even put it to a vote on like how do you think guys could be this could be measured but i like the idea of the the base reward and you know having something on, on top of that so, so, so i guess just to redirect the conversation a little bit here like i think we should definitely have some kind of like added bonus reward for help growth but we also need a floor for like editor contributions 
So that way we make sure that like everybody who is earning the editor rewards, like is putting in the work to deserve them. So we definitely need some kind of like minimum floor that we can point to if we want to remove people from the editor program to say like, hey, we communicated you need to do this and you didn't. So we're going to remove you and replace you with somebody else. Okay. Uh, so, so we, at the end of this part, we will need to figure out these numbers, basically. And I, because I think this kind of brings it all together, and maybe this will clarify my point. I absolutely want to quantify things. I'm so big on accountability. I totally think we're overpaid. So the what I'm really trying to say, I guess, is, and maybe this is, you know, and y'all can say, well, you're wrong, Scott, is what I feel like is that the current system of paper comment, um, those kinds of things is unnecessarily restrictive. And what would be better is something like X number of papers, X number of comments, you know, or X, Y, and Z. So that, you know, people don't have to do all 10 things they can do, but they're doing seven things that they're most into or whatever it may be. They don't have to do all four things, but they can do two. And, you know, cause people are gonna disagree on how to do this and how to get there. Um, if that makes sense, in other words, you know, you can get 100% by doing three of the things. Um, I just feel like can kind of open it up uh, to, you know, going to what Ricardo said, like so much of what people are doing and I see like all y'all doing. So I, I don't know if you've heard funny story. I thought Anton was in Russia till like a week ago. So every time I saw Anton, I was like, why is he awake? But in any case, there's so much like just being on this call, right? Is not going to be in those metrics. But these people on this call are spending, you know, serious time and thought and effort to try to get us there. And so just being more inclusive of the range of ways we're contributing. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, we, we will be cognizant of that, of course, but I think we still need, like Patrick said, we need some sort of baseline, right? So that we basically, we can talk to editors who are essentially like long-term AFK, they don't do anything. We need formal criteria to uh, discuss the contribution kind of thing. So Olga had a hand. Uh... Yeah, I'm just like, want to, you know, add my five cents about not equating uh, like hub growth with the success of editor. And I feel like I am representing here uh, a majority of editors who are either PhD students or like early researchers who are very early in their careers. They don't have social capital. They have negative social capital. And if they annoy people, they can lose even more, etc., etc. So I think we should be very mindful of this situation and kind of like not pressure editors to bring people. And yeah, so basically that's what I wanted to say. If we need to come up with a solution before this call is done, um, which I mean is a half joke. What about like doubling, tripling, even quadrupling the requirements that are present right now? Except I would propose change it from, let's say you have to do a paper and a comment to two things that, you know, it can be a paper or a comment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah totally. what do you all think? So, Not so, saying it's a good idea, just proposing. Mm -hmm. The point of this like, portion of the call right now is to collect feedback. We have like a, a DAO operations call with some of the community leaders later tonight where we'll actually like, set the minimum requirements, but this, this is for feedback purposes um, in, in order to help inform that discussion. So do you all think that four pieces of content per week, it can be a comment or a paper? More or less, what do you think? Seven, okay. Thoughts on seven? The other thing we can end up doing here is proposing like uh, three or four different minimum cutoffs and having a doubt vote um, in order to choose like whatever, you know, the community determines is what makes the most sense. So yeah, I think that there will be a couple of options that come out of this. We just have to have some kind of like 
um, minimum standard to point to. We can do um, around seven, so like four, seven, ten. Sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that I think that's fine to, you know, increase the requirements because I think one paper one comment was to start off with per week per it was pretty low. Um, I guess I have a comment regarding, I guess, those who contribute a lot and might feel like it's an unfair situation. But I mean, that's that was the given standard from the beginning. So if people are following the given standard of one paper, one comment per week, that was what they were told to do. And so to kind of resent people for doing what they were told to do seems a little silly to me. But I mean, you know, those who are contributing more, they are getting more RC with every comment, with every upvote, with every paper. They, you know, I, I find that, you know, if you write a good comment, it kind of compounds on itself. You know, like once some people upvote it, you know, it gets a little bit more attention and it starts to kind of increase. So they are getting like those rewards. Anyone who's contributing more than the bare minimum is definitely getting more rewards. So um, just that's just a little bit of perspective I have. I mean, just because that was what was set as the beginning requirement. Um, increasing it is completely reasonable. Um, that's all. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and like I, I think I don't think anybody feels resentful. Like in the conversations that I had, it's definitely not like a like an emotional feeling at all. It's more like um, wanting uh, the community to be successful. And so like holding like each other to a standard I think is like an important part of like having a successful team so yeah definitely just want to iterate that nobody's been like angry or anything this is more just about like uh, practically how do we help this project be successful yeah that makes sense That's more thoughts on the baseline requirements what about the activities themselves do you think we should keep it to comments and upload or should we uh, introduce other options perhaps maybe a hypothesis would count as two because it's so big maybe five <laughs> a proper hypothesis i, I agree yeah I feel like unfortunately hypotheses are mostly hub dependent. Like I have like 10 people in my hub. If I post a hypothesis, it's going to be like me commenting myself, most probably, <laughs> unfortunately. Like it's, it's difficult. I would like to, I would love to actually, but I need to get some traction in terms of like people getting to my hub before I actually I have so many hypotheses that I want to test, but if, if I post them now, I can post them in the future, you know? So it's, yeah. I, I just wanted to, to say something very quick that I think just having these uniform metrics for all of the hubs and because different hubs attract different types of people, different number of people, then you might end up having the situation of a repository for some of the hubs. I, I, I think I, I totally agree with all the conversations that we need to raise a bar, no question about it. But I think also maybe it makes sense to be a little bit flexible um, based on, on the nature of each hop uh, and kind of, I mean, to Scott's point, like criminology, I think is probably going to be less attractive for some other people than neuroscience or, or something about physics or, or, or health related issues. I agree with that. I think something like COVID, a topic like COVID or um, something that like that is it's in the news so much and everyone's really interested in you know learning what the research is on that but you know for my hub it's telecommunications I feel like it's sort of not a lot of people who aren't in the industry would be interested in it very much so <laughs> there are differences in in topics for sure and I think to reiterate too we're very much in experimentation mode so I think like you know, it's a little bit of trial and error where, like, I think we need to implement something. You know, it'll work well for some, it won't work well for others, and, um, like, we'll get that feedback and improve it over time. So I think there's been, like, a decent amount of feedback here, and I'll, like, um, reach out to, like, uh, some other people individually to just get, like, uh, you know, more data points on what we think minimum activity should be. 
and then we, we can have a DAO vote. So that way it's uh, everybody's on the same page and we can choose between a couple different options. Scott? I mean, no, well, I can't go after that. All I was going to say is um, an idea, and this is part of like things I'd really like to do for growth, is in addition to the little things, a more substantial contribution to the hub, like my co-editor is making some really cool guides right now for teachers to use to use Research Hub as part of their class as an assignment, whether it's like an essay or, you know, like to develop these kinds of discussions and up clicks and down clicks, but just more generally, and this goes into like the social media stuff, if we could maybe, and this is just a suggestion for Patrick, think, okay, there's a different thing we do each month as editors, and maybe we can choose from three of them, you know, set up Twitter or make an assignment template or, you know, something else cool that's bigger um, that hopefully will, you know, have a, you know, a bigger effect as well in terms of bringing in people. And that, you know, and again, we've already talked about that, the, the, the AMAs and all of that, but just kind of maybe make those a requirement. You got to do one of the, the three or whatever, choose your favorite one. I like that a lot. I think like a paper of the month and like three other people to comment it, on it or something, that, that could be a good one. Um, cool. Yeah, so, so we're so we could... now. now. Uh, sorry, just just to quickly add on that. So we, we could uh, explore this idea even more and kind of like treat different activities as worth different amount of points or whatever. Like you have to make 10 contribution points a week and it could be either 10 papers or it could be two hypotheses or it could be one paper of the of the month event, something like that. Just throwing ideas out there. Sorry, it, Patrick, it, interrupted. It, yeah, no, no worries. It seems like we've got pretty solid feedback. Um, so we'll talk about it a little bit more later tonight, and then post a couple options and do our first job. I think this is a pretty solid first job. So, um, yeah. Does anybody else have any like final thoughts before uh, we uh, call this meeting? Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for showing up and for sharing all this feedback. Um, I've got a couple action items here, so I'll follow up uh, on some of the things that we talked about, and then 